morning, everybody. I'm happy to welcome you back in the main auditorium for the um, plenary session about blockchain and the UBI. With me on the panel, I have Julio Linares, I have Martin Batist, there you are, I have Bela Hatvani, good morning, I have Matthew Slater and Hilde Latour. My name is Joy Ponader. Um, I'm the co-founder of the My Basic Income, My uh, Income and Basic Income Raffle, and I am started Sanction Free some years ago with some wonderful people. Azaman, the scientific expert, is also here attending the conference, the scientific expert of Sanction Free. And at the moment, I'm working on the Basic Income Office. We founded this in May this year, on the 1st of May, the work of the Day of Labor. And uh, we will introduce a um, big scale, saturated pilot study uh, for basic income in Germany within the next years. And we will do it by initiating a people's initiative and then a people's vote on the topic within Germany. It will go online within the next weeks and I hope you will all sign up for this. Today the topic is um, universal basic income and the blockchain. So I guess I do not have to introduce universal basic income, UBI, to you, um, which doesn't mean that you all have the same idea about it, but we have a lot of ideas of UBI in the room. And perhaps there are also some ideas about blockchain in the room, and I think one of the challenges of this panel will be not only to um, discuss the differences and the approaches and the ups and downs, of the blockchain, but also perhaps to deal with some concepts, perhaps some people in the audience who don't have any concept about the blockchain, which is quite good, because there are also a lot of misconcepts about blockchain in the world. So I would like to take uh, two or three minutes of the 75 that we have in total to give you a rough idea of what the blockchain is. So if you imagine we are a community and we want to set up a blockchain, and everyone who has an information that they want to write into that database. Basically, a blockchain is not an application, but it's an idea, it's a concept, how to write, uh, to write data in a decentralized and dynamic database. So if you imagine that anyone who wants to write something into the blockchain would stand up and just shout it into the room, and everybody else would write it down on a piece of paper. And then like every two or three minutes, I would hand out a couple of dice into your hands, like let's say five or six dice for everybody, and you roll it until you have only sixes. And the one who has only sixes shouts, hey, I have it, bingo. And this is the person who signs the paper where they wrote down all the things someone shouted into the room. So it could be that this paper wasn't completely complete because they overheard something, but after two or three minutes, the same process starts again. And after several rounds, it's quite uh, secure that every information that was in the room is written down on these signed papers. And also on these papers, you have a reference to the paper that had been signed two or three minutes before. So the papers are called the blocks. And these references make it a chain. So you have a chain of these papers. And if you put all these papers on a pile, we have a complete protocol of all the information that had been shouted into the room within all the time that we had set up this blockchain. So this perhaps can give you a basic idea about how a blockchain works. There are also other um, means of signing those papers, those blocks, than doing hard work like rolling dice or something. Um, uh, the concept I just explained was is called proof of work, which it's sometimes consuming a lot of energy, perhaps you heard about that, but there are also different concepts that are called proof of stake or other proofs where um, it's more like um, a randomly selection or it depends on what information you wrote into the blockchain that gives you the right to sign the paper. And essentially also when you have identities on the blockchain so you know there are real persons behind the uh, the people who interact in the blockchain, then you can have also some concepts that are less more energy consum consumption based than the proof of work. So I hope this gives you a rough idea. I think um, Bela and others will also give you some, um, some general um, information about the blockchain. But first, I would like to ask Julio um, to give us a short introduction. I asked the panel to make really short introductions, about like seven, maximum eight minutes. Then we would have a discussion on the panel about the ups and downs of these approaches and the concept 
uh, of the blockchain in general, and we will also open the discussion to the public. Um, we will only have presentations from Julio, Martin, and Bella, and then Matthew and Hilda will react to this and start the conversation here on the panel. So, Julio, um, you already know him from yesterday and the, also from the, the Bien in general. He, he is a social outreach of Bien, um, an economic anthropologist. He's um, starting the UBI Cafe, or already did that in Berlin, and is he keeps told me he is an ethnographic research crypto in the crypto UBI space. So, and we are very happy to hear some insights from your ethnographic research within the crypto UBI. Hello, thank you, Joy. Thank you, everybody, for the minute of silence. Um, I'm really grateful to be here. Over the past year or so, I've been sort of uh, dwelling on the sort of emergent uh, so-called crypto UBI or open UBI spaces that, so it's groups of people that claim that they can bring about a basic income um, through this technology that is called the blockchain. Now, I'm an economic anthropologist. As, as an economic anthropologist, my field of study is actually money. So I kind of look at the history of debt and uh, uh, its whole dynamics over the past 5,000 years of history. Um, and for me, it was kind of strange to go into the space and try to understand how you know all this whole crypto world works in general, and then specifically the whole promise of what a crypto UBI can do. And so um, this is the result of the, a bit of what I've been trying to do to try to, you know, by way of analogy, I want to try to uh, give you a bit of uh, an understanding of what I think uh, is happening within the crypto, the crypto space, and then assess critically the political economy of, of these blockchains to try to see if they can actually uh, provide some sort of, if they can try to uh, actually achieve or uh, provide us some sort of um, alternative to towards creating a viable basic income. And so um, the crypto world is a small uh, refraction or, uh, of, of something that is happening uh, in the world at large, which is this sort of return to a type of neo-feudal or virtual feudal type of world uh, with the Amazons and the, and the Googles and the Facebooks of the day. Um, now, um, the, the crypto world uh, is feudal in many ways, and I'll try to explain why I, I say that. Um, so, you might have heard of Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin is, uh, was sort of the first iteration in this type of uh, cryptocurrency, uh, and it started about 10 years ago, um, basically with a very regressive idea of what money is, in the sense that... Um, the amount of Bitcoin that is supposed to be minted, I think it's 21 million. And so from the get-go, the design of money itself is, is, is thought about in this sort of scarcity mindset. And the way that the, the blockchains are mined uh, happens through uh, how competitive the network is. So the more uh, computers that are mining the, 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 the Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency that uses this type of algorithm called proof of work, um, they, um, it, it gets more and more complex as more network, as more, as, as more computers are in the network. So that's why you have such a big uh, ecological destruction, right? So it is not only this type of scarcity mindset of how money works, so Canada can return to gold, uh, virtual gold or digital metallism, some people call it. Um, it is also uh, not an alternative in terms of how viable it is now. The purpose of making this panel was to bring about some of the minds uh, that are the best in terms of complementary currencies, thinking about the commons and some uh, real world examples of uh, potential actual alternatives to a UBI on the blockchain. So um, I would like to say that technology only goes as far as the ethics and the values that were put into it. And I think it's important to say that um, it is not about trying to solve a political problem with a technical solution. That's what international development agencies try to do all over the world. It doesn't work. Um, I think if one needs to use this type of technology, one has to be critical of it, of its political economy, and use it politically for the sake of bringing about something like uh, a money commons. And so that's kind of where I'm coming from in terms of understanding this space and being critical of it, uh, and, and, and hence trying to, to bring about an alternative. So let's talk a bit about the political economy of crypto. Uh, so in terms of the land, um, most uh, of the production of the computers that are 
uh, used in order to create these coins or these virtual tokens happen in places like Taiwan, uh, where a lot of these computers are made. Uh, initially, I think there were gaming computers that had uh, the capacity of being very fast and eventually were used uh, as a side effect to mine all this Bitcoin. Oftentimes, the, the places where these tokens are mined are in places where electricity is very cheap. So in the valleys of China, uh, that where there is a lot of electricity coming from dams uh, that is subsidized actually by the Chinese government. And so uh, also places like Venezuela uh, actually as well. And so people set up these huge mines of uh, computer electronics to try to mine this type of coin as a way of bringing about some sort of value to, to them. So uh, again, it's a store of value. It's the money usage that all this crypt most of the crypto uh, currencies have is as a store of value. If, if anything. In terms of the labor, um, there, uh, there is um, the computers, you know, they, they, they are said to be working in the sense that they're mining. This is the, the word that is used to describe how the computers are uh, hashing these algorithms, making them work until you get a new block. Uh, but there's actually a lot of uh, invisible labor inside of the crypto world whereby, um, you know, there is a lot of uh, conferences that happen where all these people that are very knowledgeable about um, you know, mathematics and, and computer programming and so on meet and sort of talk to each other in this type of bubble. So, and so uh, a lot of the labor happens in these type of spaces. Uh, Berlin is a huge hub for it. That's why I'm there trying to figure out how this whole space works out. Um, and so basically it's a bunch of mathematicians, computer programmers and so on that are inside of the space. If I mean, um, and then the money. Uh, how does the money actually work or how is it produced? And so as uh, Joy briefly mentioned, there are many algorithms that can be used to produce the tokens. So the, the Bitcoin one is called a proof of work, which is a type of um, algorithm that, as I said, just increase, uh, it becomes increasingly complex as, as time goes by, as more computers join the network. Uh, but there are many others. And so there is this other one called proof of stake, whereby the more tokens you have, um, you call them, they call, the people that have a lot of tokens in the space are called whales because they own a lot of tokens. So in a way, the way that they sign the systems means that the more tokens you have, you can decide what is the next block. You can make a bet towards the future and say, this is the block that I think will be the one that is next. And if your bet uh, is correct, then you, you get a reward. And so I think regardless of, of, of the mainstream types, most of them form a type of plutocracy in the sense that uh, all the virtual vassals in the network are sort of paying some type of fee towards the people that actually own the means of production of these things and then pay back some sort of fee in a, in a way to all these whales. Next slide, please. Socially, social-wise, uh, as you might imagine, this place is very chaotic. Uh, there is an essay by Joe Freeman in the 70s analyzing the feminist movements that were sort of anti, uh, anti-hierarchies, let's say, uh, but didn't really arrange power in ways that they actually decentralized it. And so uh, it's in the crypto world, there's also a lot of people that are well-intended and want to sort of create a world sort of more or less without hierarchies, some of them at least, that are trying to create these decentralized egalitarian structures but really don't know how. So there's a lot of unstructured structures in terms of you know how communication channels work, how power works. Rules are not explicit but implicit. And there is elite channels of communication. There is a star system. So think of all these people uh, that you often hear about, like Vitalik, Buterin, and all these types of uh, stars that pop up. And there's a lot of confusion. And, um, and this is what creates the tyranny, because people enter the space and don't know what's going on. And it's really hard and confusing to, to get to. And so in a way, it's no different than how money is produced today by bureaucrats in private banks and central banks. And so there is a weird uh, sort of element to this. And so their understanding of power is actually kind of awkward in that regard. In terms of the social people, there is the, the crypto kings, as I call them. Uh, they're the ones that started uh, out the whole system. They discovered the mines, the early adopters. Most of them are libertarians or anarcho-capitalists. There's few sort of socialist or communist, anarcho-communist people in the space. And they have good intentions. You know, a lot of them have uh, these beliefs in the free market, uh, sort of re rediscovering Hayek and all these types of uh, uh, Milton Friedman libertarian uh, Ideologies, uh, tr transparency and decentralization are also some other, other of their values. Two minutes. So they're also the aristocrats or the crypto aristocrats, which are like the kinship uh, structures around the crypto kings that end up doing a lot of the, of the work for them or are just really good at talking and don't know really much about uh, uh, how the actual code works. They have this weird 
assumption that voting is the same as democracy, which is a very aristocratic notion of democracy, whereby people think that just because people vote, uh, we have some sort of democracy in a token system online. And so there is few social interaction that happens in real life. And they have this ideal sometimes that, want, that they want to automate politics. And this is also part of the tyranny. Wanting to automate politics is also very, it's very, very political and tyrannical at best. And of course, there are the crypto wizards, so all the computer programmers producing knowledge of the system, mathematicians, uh, logic, logicians, and so on. They maintain and improve the system, but of course the problem is that they're all wizards. There are no witches in the system. And so, if we're, you know, as I said, it's this type of neo-feudal world where uh, it's kind of the rule of code uh, that's emerging. And so, this is a bit of a problem, uh, as you might imagine. And so, uh, that, now that doesn't mean that um, we cannot have some sort of radical de democratic way in which we arrange these, uh, these uh, attempts. And so, uh, as I just have one minute, I guess I'll leave it to, to Martin and the rest to sort of uh, show what other alternatives can there be in terms of how can you arrange a blockchain that is not ecologically destructive, such as the Duniter one, um, and is actually egalitarian in many aspects uh, in terms of its design and its value system. And so I'll leave it at that for now, and we can talk a bit more about how everything else works. Sorry if it, I rushed it a bit. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, Julio, for this ethnological overview, anthrop anthropological overview of the blockchain scene. Um, next in our presentations is Martin, Martin Baptiste from France. Um, he is um, part of the team of the Libre Money concept. Libre Money is a concept, I think Martin will explain to us in a second. Um, the um, blockchain implementation they did is called Duniter, and this is a crypto money project, and they have a also a currency there called G1. When you hear Libra money, you hear this word Libra, free, and as Richard Stallman famously said, this um, meaning of the word free, like Libra, is meant in, as in free speech, not in free beer. I asked Martin about his first experience with money, and he told me the story that when he was 15, he got his first credit card from the bank, and the PIN, which was a very easy to guess number, and so you were quite upset about that. How can that be? I get my first credit card with money and I get just a, a guessable pin. So I'm also interested if the Duniter is a bit more sophisticated than this. Yeah, you can choose. My name is Martin, so it's a pleasure to, to be part of this Congress. So thank you for the invitation. So I'm going to talk about the, the Libre Money project that is going on in, uh, in France right now. So to, uh, I'm, I'm sorry because I'm going to speak a bit fast and see a lot of things, but there will be a lot of animation, so I, I warn you. Um, so first, uh, before going in through the, the technique and the real project, we have to talk about firstly the, the theory of Libre Money. We spoke about it yesterday a little bit. So how works the, the current system? So basically, the, it's, it's an oversimplifying scheme, but the states or the bank are creating money through, and the tap needs to to, in order to be flowing constantly, needs a constant economical growth. And the money is actually destroyed when the debt are paid back. So uh, this is how works the, the, the macro economy today. And so there is one, one version of the, the, the one we, we spoke about the most of the basic income. is to take one amount of money inside the bath and allocate it somewhere else to found a UBI. So another approach, if you, get rid, if you try to get rid of the system, of the current system, is to say, uh, can we imagine that every people can be a, his own tab of money, an equal and, and with an equal flow? This is the, the, the question asked by the, the relative theory of money, which is a mathematical discovery that has been made by, the, by a French mathematician that show that there is one mathematical solution uh, to think about uh, a money that is created equally. So I'm going to be very brief. If you're not comfortable to, with math, it's not a problem. I, I won't enter into details. But the relative theory of money it's, can be seen as an application to money creation mostly. So how we create money if we don't use debt? How we, can we create money differently? And tr trying to apply this sentence, so all human beings are, f are born free and equal in rights. So it's a more French way to say uh, money is a common. 
So it should be created equally. So when we say that, um, we have to understand that if we decide, for example, if this auditorium is a community, if we decide to create money, at once in one uh, in space, so here, we will all create the same amount of money. So everyone will create the same amount of money. But it's, uh, this sentence also has to be understood as well in time. So it means that the generation of the future uh, has to create money like we did. So, the, so this is the two equations when you, when you try to apply it mathematically that can, that can. And when you solve it, you have, two, you have one single result actually. So uh, the first is that the, 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 the shape of the money mass grow. So the, the, the amount of money that, that you are creating ha has to uh, evolve in an exponential way. So it, it's growing exponentially. And the second consequence is that every time you make the money mass grow, so every year, for example, you make the money mass grow, you create more money, you divide it by the number of people that are in, the commun in this community. So uh, that's what the, the equation at the, at the bottom shows. It's the universal dividend. And the universal dividend, it's, it's kind of a basic income by money creation itself. So it's... Uh, this is the fundamental result of the theory. It's that there is one possibility to, uh, to imagine uh, an, an equal uh, a money creation that is equal in space and in time. To understand uh, better, so the, the, there is one thing we have to, to set is, is to find uh, at what rhythm we create money, how much money, uh, how much more money we create every year. And this is uh, a calculation, so I just put the result. This is, we, we, we calculate the rhythm of money creation. It has to fit the rhythm of the human flow. So the, the, the speed of, the, um, of how the, the, the renewal of the generation. So it's set mostly by the life expectancy. So when you have a life expectancy between 60 and 80 years, the equation gives you a, a C of, uh, so a money mass grow of 10% per year. So to understand better, uh, we will make a, a small, uh, small exponential. So, so as we saw, the, the money mass is uh, growing exponentially. So the, in an exponential is like this. So we will imagine that this amount of money is a circle and we're going to make it grow. So let's take, uh, let's take uh, a random situation. So there, on this amount of money, there is uh, these uh, four people in color that owns this part of money, and there is four others that owns the black part of money. So it's an initial situation that it's uh, voluntarily unequal to see how it works. So, we, so the, the very important part of, the, of this uh, Libra money is the fact that when you understand that money is, uh, I mean, uh, owning uh, 1,000 unit or $1,000 doesn't mean anything. What is really important is to, it's to know I owe, I, I owe $1,000 compared to the, the global money mass that is existing compared to the average amount of money that every, all, all the people in the economy has. So when you create money equally like this, you can, you can use whether the, the quantitative amount so is the size of the circles or the relative part. So I, hear, I put here the, the percentage. So here you have, for example, the, the, the girl in blue has 27% of the, of, the, of the money mass. So now we make a jump of 12 years in the future and in 12 years we create that amount of money. So at a, at a rate of, uh, of 10% a year. So what, what's happening is there are eight people in, the, in this example, so we divide it by eight parts, and each part is called the universal dividend. So this is the part that everyone receives. So the consequence is so everyone gets a part, an equal part, and so the, the new situation is like this. So uh, if we compare it with the previous situation, we see that quantitatively everyone has created money, but relatively, for example, the, the girl in blue again, her relative part dropped from the 27% to 17%. For the example, uh, the, the person in here in uh, yellow dies at this moment, and he's, he stops to create money when he dies, and at the same time, the, the girl in, in green arrives. So again, we make a jump of 12 years, 
So, uh, and we split it in eight again. And this is the new uh, universal dividend that it's bigger than the, the previous one. And it's logical because it's an exponential. So we, everyone creates a part. So this is the, the new situation. So this is the, the three situations. So we see that in, in time, everyone has created money, but the important part is the relative part. So when we see that in, so this is the different stage we saw. So when you see the size of the circle, the quantitative, everyone created money. So we don't understand a lot of things from this graph. And, and some economists might say, yeah, there is a big problem because you create way, more, way too much money and it will lead to a very huge inflation. But it doesn't matter as long as the inflation is created equally. So what matters, again, it's the relative reference. So how much I have compared to the other. So when we see the, in the percent we saw in this graph, we saw that there is no inflation. What, what's happening is that the money is, is stable at the average money mass. So it is really important to understand that, that when you create money equally, there is no inflation. I mean, there is inflation, but it, it doesn't have negative effect because everyone create, is part of this inflation. So relatively, everything is stable. And the most inter interesting part is that everyone with time uh, converged to the average money mass. From that, you, you have two solutions when you understand this kind of mechanism. You can say, oh yeah, that's good. Uh, let's go to talk to the banks and the states. Talking in percent or talking in the number of universal dividend is the same thing. I won't enter into the detail because I just have one minute. I, I'm going to talk about the... So according to this, uh, to this theory, there was a software development for some years. And two, two years ago, the first uh, crypto uh, Libra money has been created in France. And, uh, and it's called uh, G1, in French it's La Jeune. And this is uh, so a cryptocurrency co-created by everyone. So how, how does it work? So there is one challenge when you, when you start to create this kind of system is that you have to avoid that uh, people uh, want to create two accounts for themselves. So the people want to create fake accounts to, to receive twice the, the universal dividend and it will be unequal. So in order to, to avoid that, we have a system called Web of Trust where the, the different members certify each other. And in order to be creator of money, to start to create universal dividend like all the other people in this Web of Trust, you, uh, you have to be certified that uh, the people know you physically in the, in the real world and they're certifying the application in the software that you are this this person connected to this number of accounts to the public key. So thanks to that, we are able to detect with time the person who are, who are trying to, to, to create fake accounts. So how the blockchain works. So the, the blockchain contains the mathematical equation. So the, the, that's how the universal dividend is automatically generated on the different accounts. Then the, the blockchain can deal with the transaction. So here you see a transaction, for example. For the blocks and the, the, the books of account that Joy uh, explained a little bit. So it's a, it's a chain of block that contains uh, information. So each block contains, for example, transactions or certification. The fact that we need to have five certifications. So, the, so this is the, the history. And uh, the blockchain works, the, so it's called the Duniter blockchain, which is an independent blockchain. And uh, so how it works, the, uh, at one point, one, one member of the blockchain who owns a, a, a computer that can, be cal cal that can calculate uh, blocks for the blockchain, he's going to uh, generate the uh, next block. And the next one is, is going to be generated by another member. So that's how we have, uh, and then the, when the, the, the blockchain is linked, like you see, is then automatically replicated on all the computer of the network. So like this, we have, uh, we have a decentralized network. So uh, in the network, it's not mandatory that every member has to own a, a node or a computer for, for calculate blocks. And uh, the web of trust we saw before allows the blockchain to be uh, I don't enter in the detail, but allows the blockchain to be to consume very few energy because it, it doesn't require uh, 
uh, a huge amount of energy to generate the, to generate the, the blocks. So that's how it works. So technically, the, the, the blockchain is called Uniter. And how we make the transaction, we have a web, um, a smartphone application and also a web application where you can deal with your, with your account. You can do certification and transaction. So this is the Cesium. It's really easy to use. And thanks to these tools, uh, so it has been developed for years and, and the Libra money, so the G1 has been launched uh, more than two years ago. And thanks to that, we have uh, now people uh, that are exchanging goods and services using this money that they are co-creating. So we have a lot of events in France where people are exchanging goods and services. So it's, it's the beginning, so they are exchanging uh, basic goods, but sometimes we see that there is smartphone exchange in this, in this currency, bicycles, washing machine, uh, trips. Uh, for myself, I, I've bought, I was able to invite my brother in a restaurant that accepts this, this currency. At, at the same time, it's locally, it's geographically um, located, <clears throat> but, it, it's not, but there is also exchange that, uh, that can happen far away. For example, with a, a web platform called Jechange, it's like eBay, but in, uh, in June, in G1. So where people propose goods and services to sell or to buy. And there is, sometimes, there is exchange between the north of France and the south of France. So that's how it works. So yeah, for example, this is the, an extract of my, an, of my account at one time. So you see at the top here, you have the two expression of the money, so you have relative, in relative part, so it's like in percent when you call in UD, DU, it's in French, sorry. And, and just under it, there is the quantitative part. So you can see that every, every day in this system, we create a universal dividend every day. And this, what you see for the rest is the, the transaction I've, uh, I've done. So I mostly receive money because, uh, because I do conferences about this topic. And sometimes I buy things, so I bought beer. So as your question, uh, I bought them. It was not free, but it, it was bought with the currency I, I've created. Everything is transparent in the system, and this is a very big difference with the current system, where you can see in real time how many, uh, uh, how many June, so how many units of money there is, and what is the money mass, the average money mass per person. And you can see how much member there is. So now it's a bit old, this picture. Now we are 2,200 people in France that are creating money. There is more people exchanging this money that are not co-created than they will probably become. But this is, we are, and so it's, a, it's now a rising economy uh, using this, uh, this uh, basic income by, by uh, money creation. So it's still very, very, it's still small. You cannot live only with that, of course, but two years ago, nothing of this was existing. And now you can start to buy things slowly uh, with this money. Thank you for your attention. I hope it was a bit, uh, yeah, not too fast. Thank you. For the Thank you, Martin. Bela, I think um, you are the one who has the most oversight in your lifetime over databases. You have been... I don't have to introduce you, you already have been on the panel yesterday, but um, you are the co-founder of the Mustard Seed Trust, and you have been involved in many, many projects that um, develop databases. You were in the project with the first online catalog for, for libraries that I also used as a student, OPAC, and uh, with CD-ROMs and with client-server databases. And, but I think you're not only the one who has perhaps the most insight about the history of, of writing data into some electronic ledgers, but also the history of money, because I heard from you the first time you earned money by yourself was 1956, with a weekly salary of seven pounds at those times. So I think you saw also in economy evolving and the, the, how we understand money. I think we understand it better nowadays than we did 50 years ago. And I'm very interested to hear your insights, how you see the blockchain as a means for us. I have an impossible task for five minutes. Um, Hilda said the other day that you give young people uh, the go, and they, I don't know exactly what you said, but you said they just get going. And that's, Martin, for me, is illustrating uh, what you said. And he's one of uh, hundreds of 
such initiatives, or thousands, that are going on. So I want to just try and help uh, share how, to orient, how I learned to orient myself in a world of accelerating change and, and in that context uh, talk about the blockchain from a kind of layperson's perspective. I spent 60, over 60 years in data processing and I've seen, uh, it's like I've lived uh, 10,000 years because the change has been so great. If you think about change in linear terms, it would, I've lived 10,000 years. <laughs> uh, so I think Martin, to me, was illustrating that the money system we have at the moment is a kind of monoculture. It's like we just have pines or wheat and it's very efficient, but it's totally non-resilient. So we constantly have financial crashes and, and crises. Uh, in Switzerland, a long time ago, they introduced a, a, the weir, and we know that Swiss, uh, the Swiss economy is one of the most stable in the world because they had uh, multiple currencies running simultaneously. And so the world we're stepping into is one in which, enabled by the blockchain, there will be a polyculture. Uh, nature shows us that when you have a monoculture, it's subject to flooding, to fires, and to all sorts of destructive forces. And in a poly polyculture, uh, it's much, much more resilient. So, in order, I noticed that, you know, UBI, this movement, kind of characterizes itself as what it's doing now. It was very dangerous when the chairman of Cunard stood on the bridge of Queen Mary and a little, little airplane went over 60 years ago or something and he said, I don't think people will ever travel in those noisy little machines when they can use one of our state cabins. He didn't understand that whole world was changing. So while we're now focused on income, universal basic income, we actually need to orient ourselves in, in a much more complex world because we're all of the same heart. And what is it that we, we, we really want? So our focus is in mustard seed, the focus is to enable a caring world, but a perspective by keeping our eye on the money side, which is very important, the human culture. We're moving from a domination culture to a, uh, uh, a collaborative uh, partnership kind of culture. I recommend the books of Rihanna Eisler, Rihanna Eisler, uh, on that subject. Of, uh, and then the, uh, the other important thing we're all aware of is the earth and to keep our eyes on that. So there's a kind of three-legged perspective uh, on our and our focus in the middle. Um, Humankind has moved from various enslavement mechanisms. Uh, you know, we've gone through feudal enslavement, uh, colonization enslavement. We're now in the era of money enslavement. I do assure you that the rich are as non-free as the poor. I've had the misfortune of living in amongst the rich and they're riddled with fear and lack of freedom. Uh, it might be hard for the non-rich to understand that, but I scuttled out of that world uh, uh, very quickly uh, by 
helping to create mustard seed with, with my wife and getting rid of all that enslavement. So it's just another, it's another end of the spectrum, but the money is still enslaving the rich in a different way from the way that it enslaves the poor. Now, I'm, so I'm kind of meandering around to try and orient ourselves. But to come back to the blockchain, uh, at, a, at a user level, it's a record of what has occurred, a ledger. Uh, it's also a mechanism where you can add contracts. So uh, a contract defines uh, a transaction. So it not only allows you to keep a record of what has occurred, but also uh, the, the agreement around each occurrence. And then furthermore, it can also, and people are working on this, maintain uh, an encodement of, of the law, which defines how contracts will be written. So imagine a society we're moving into where all of the law will be encoded in the blockchain and they will define the kind of contracts that can be written and that will define the kind of transactions that can be recorded or be entered into and recorded. And so it will, it will provide a mechanism where we no longer require centralized government. Uh, and we will actually co-elaborate, co-create uh, laws, etc. This is the possibility. Uh, the danger is that all of this falls into the hands of the powerful few. But actually, we've learned that the long tail is much, much bigger than the big guys, you know. If you, if you have a distribution of the, the rich and powerful, the mass of the long tail, the poor, is much, much bigger. And it ultimately uh, wins out. So there's a kind of stabilizing force it. So, I don't know what the hell I've said. So that's it. I just really want to reiterate the blockchain can record uh, transactions, contracts, and laws. And there are all sorts of people like Martin, thousands of them, elaborating an extraordinary new world. And we need to orient ourselves much more broadly than just being about universal basic income uh, because otherwise we don't have the agility to negotiate the change that is occurring uh, that that's my message thank you so matthew Sl slater is a community currency engineer you programmed an operating system that is used by more than 300 local community groups for a community currency, and you are also uh, creating uh, MOOCs, like massive, massive online uh, open courses. You can see Matthew's course on the money and society when you Google for the money and society MOOC. So Matthew, nice to have you on the panel. Thank you. So I started developing community currencies a little before the blockchain, and uh, in doing that, my mind opened up to all the possibilities of what money could be. And when the blockchain came along and Bitcoin was launched and everyone got very excited about it, to me it was a very narrowing experience because Bitcoin comes with a very particular view of money as uh, an asset with no intrinsic value and a very fixed uh, quantity and a rigid monetary policy. So the idea behind Bitcoin, as Julio was saying before, is that we could 
automate government. Uh, and in Bitcoin, you're automating monetary policy. So there's no flexibility in there for a society to respond monetarily to whatever's happening in the real world. And a lot of people got very excited about Bitcoin and they started making uh, clones of it or variations on it. But the variations to me were just the same as Bitcoin. So a new blockchain project would launch and they would say, well, hey, it's different from Bitcoin because instead of 21 million tokens, we're going to issue 100 billion tokens. As if that really made any difference to the, to the monetary policy or to anybody. And they would say, instead of making a new block every 10 minutes, we're going to make a new block every 10 seconds. As if that was better somehow. But the fundamental monetary ideas behind all of these blockchains were very much the same. And I was very uh, disappointed to see that limitation. And there was also an idea that just because you can build a ledger means that you can create a currency. And, and to me, that wasn't the case. You can have a payment system, you can have an idea that I own some tokens and I can give it to some other people, but that doesn't make a money system. And more than that, it doesn't mean that there's any value in the money system or that anybody is going to use it. In the basic income movement, the strategy is to work with the government and to work with the existing money system in order to try to transfer wealth from the rich to the poor by transferring money from the rich to the poor. But if there's no wealth uh, denominated uh, in your blockchain tokens, then you haven't got anything to transfer. And if the government isn't involved because the blockchain is fully automated, then you haven't got any means to transfer the wealth either. And the original intention of the blockchain was to do money without government. So I question the value of the blockchain to the basic income movement. You can either work with the government to try to transfer the real wealth from the rich to the poor, or you could try to create another currency which you can manage and try to invite the rich people into it. That's a very hard strategy. The government itself, despite uh, some headlines to the contrary, is not going to be very interested in blockchains because blockchains were designed to obviate, to, to get rid of the government, to do things without government. So if the government wants to make a database of all the transactions, why would it use a blockchain? It can, just, uh, it can just use its computer in the central bank and give everyone an account. And it can be completely centralized and completely under government control and governance. And that is how they would more likely do it. So my concluding uh, remark is that uh, the basic income movement does not really need blockchains or really need to know anything about blockchains unless it's going to change its strategy. Thank you, Matthew. Um, and thank you also very much for getting to the point, because then we can take that point and discuss it. And uh, I would like to invite Hilda now also into the discussion. Um, you all know Hilda Latour very well, um, as we are at the PN conference, and Hilda is one of the um, pillars, uh, pillars of PN. Um, she calls herself a... Um, co-creator of a citizen's um, basic income for mankind. So Hilda, what are your thoughts on this, what you already heard, and do you think the blockchain is a tool for co-creating a basic income for man mankind? Yeah, definitely, but not, um, well, not necessarily uh, from, by creating an, uh, yet another currency, but more as a way to make sure that the rules we make and we agreed upon are not changed when the, when the amount of money increases. 
Um, we heard yesterday an example in, uh, in Canada where the government just decided to uh, not play by the rules after, the, after they won the elections. Um, if you make the rules, program them in a smart contract, and smart has nothing to do with intellect, it's just because it's you know, digital, then they call it smart, you can have a very foolish smart contract. But if you would have those rules that you distribute a basic income, um, and you have that fully automated, then it will continue to play by the rules. And um, in that way, I see uh, a lot of potential in, 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 in blockchain technology to actually make that happen. Yeah, you gave that example yesterday with Terra Zero, which I first heard from you, and which is a forest near Berlin, where the rules are re re really written into the blockchain, and so this, this forest will really... Um, be itself and own itself. And yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was an example of how you could generate money that would go into like the UBI vault, as so we, we, we call it, um, so to, to, to fuel the vault, but the distribution system itself can also be programmed on the, on, on the blockchain. And um, eventually, if you have tested it out and it works really well, you can even make it a, a, a distributed autonomous organization so that you just let it go and flow. And, um, uh, uh, and then a human being who thinks, like, you know, uh, well, there is a, a one billion of money in the vault. I think I should have my salary raised. Those kind of issues uh, are not happening then. It's just automated. And that is um, much more efficient and much more uh, certain that you, you, it is played by the rules. Great. Is, was that already the example you wanted to give? Um, yeah, I think maybe we should give Good. the audience time to... Yeah. Awesome. So, is anyone on the panel who has the urge to react on the thoughts of Matthew and Hilde? Bella? I have a different uh, perspective from Matthew. I don't think the, well, the intention of the blockchain, in my understanding, was not to uh, create money or anything like that. It was uh, to be an incorruptible a ledger and enable trustworthiness throughout humanity. Bitcoin was built on the blockchain as a mechanism to finance the creation of the, all the cloud expenses and things like that. It was not the underlying intention in my, in my understanding. And again, uh, so that, so don't, I, I don't want Uh, this idea that the blockchain that is about money uh, to be left with you. It is about creating a mechanism to enable collaboration in a new way across humanity and enable fundamental trustworthiness by recording what has been done, what has been agreed, Uh, what the laws that we have created are, and enabling us to co-create all of that rather than enabling it to be done, uh, allowing it all to be done in a top-down, dominant kind of way. Uh, so it's a mechanism to enable collaboration and partnership. Uh, and it's absolutely central to our mission here, I think, that we move from domination culture to uh, a partnership collaborative culture. Uh, I, I do think the, when, when Hilda was talking, it came up to me that, uh, I'm not sure if this was relevant to what you were saying, but it probably was. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that UBI, we're all born with, unconditional basic income because we are we are born a trust with trustworthiness you're innocent until proved guilty so to speak so everyone is assumed to be trustworthy as a starting point and that is the will be in the future the basis of individual Uh, a basis for an important basis for individual well-being which will replace 
the purpose of money. I mean, it's, it's the underlying the trustworthiness. So if I'm trustworthy, people will transact with me. And we're all these cells in one body and we're kind of transacting with each other and money is a kind of blood flow between us. So trustworthiness is uh, the equivalent of universal basic income at a very fundamental level. And how is trustworthiness maintained? It's maintained by honoring one's word. Uh, if we honor uh, our commitments to others, we will remain trustworthy and we will remain with the ability to, to collaborate and interact. And, you know, uh, wealth is created out of nothing but collaboration. And if, so that's my thought. Okay, thank you, Bella. So, uh, Bella, so if you want to join the discussion, show me your hands. And I would like to ask you to give either a one-minute statement, but really keep it to one minute, or ask a very concrete question. So um, I would start here with Barb. Um, do we have a microphone for the, for the auditorium, or do you have to use one of ours? Yeah, thank you so much. I, I really kind of understand this a little bit better than I did when I walked into the room this morning. So I, I really That's appreciate great. this. Um, I guess the main question for me, I mean, I'm a political organizer, I've been doing it for 35 years and, you know, having to deal with the state. I mean, the fact of the matter is we're dealing in a war, you know, we're dealing in a world where huge violence is being committed both to the earth and people, all right, for the, on the basis of the current money system. And as much as I would love to ignore the people that control that, I wonder sort of how these, you know, how, say, Libra Money or, you know, the blockchain or whatever can really uh, get us to a point where we stop all of this and make a, a better world. Thank you. If there's immediate reaction, tell me, and else we could go on to par, uh, Philip and then perhaps have a reaction on to two or three yeah. aspects from the audience. It's a concrete question to Martin. Um, I understand the relationship between your proposal and blockchain is, as Bella just explained, is that you need to create trust by way of background, so there is trust in your money. So I have four very short uh, concrete questions. First, if you are um, among the 2,000, uh, is it possible for you to buy services or goods without ever selling anything? Second question is, can you open accounts for minor children? So can you have a, a sort of family benefit or so, child benefit within the, the system. Uh, the third uh, question is, can you give us an ID, an equivalent in terms of euros or whatever usual currencies of this universal dividend? You say every day there is money creation, uh, creation and uh, a universal dividend uh, given to every member in the network. At the end of a month, can you give us an idea of what that would be equivalent in terms of euros? And uh, the final question is, uh, you mentioned that you gave lectures and were paid uh, in uh, that uh, currency on the network. When I give uh, uh, lectures and I'm, I'm paid in euros or rupees or whatever, I'm taxed at 50%. Uh, when you give lectures on your network, at what rate are you being taxed? Thank you a lot. We take those two here in the front row uh, to that and then we see reactions from the panel. Thank you. Uh, Please make it short. Yes, I will. Uh, I, I want to say that the idea of the blockchain and the liberal money is an idea which ties very well with the universal basic income. And uh, I, I want to make a very quick reaction to Matthew. In my country, there was an experiment that it is going on in a slum area in Mombasa where there is some money called Bangla Pesa. And uh, the Bangla Pesa is a piece of paper in a slum, acceptable by members of that slum. 30 for, seconds. Yeah, for, for, uh, for, for exchange of goods and services, which actually goes against and obviates the same government. Because our problem, like uh, my sisters just observed here, is that 
the poverty crisis is because we are working on the dollar. And a dollar which is controlled by somebody who decides how much you receive, when you receive it, and what you must sell to get it. So when we are talking about basic income, we should think about uh, um, blockchain, which, uh, which talks about trusts, and of course Libre, where we are obviating and going against that same government. And remember, basic income is for groups which are identifiable and known, and we can verify where they are. So I think that is what we should now investigate and go further. But I think Felipe has raised some very serious issues which may need to be prosecuted before even we take it wholesomely. Thank you. Thank you very much. And my last question goes to Hilde. Uh, I understand that the forest uh, you were talking about is selling uh, by itself uh, licenses to be uh, for cutting trees. So uh, my question is, the forest cannot protect itself against being axed without any license, licensing. So where in that equation is the protecting of the forest against, so uh, to speak, illegal axing? Okay, let's see if we can find some answers or reactions to the comments. And then I've seen two more questions that perhaps we can include uh, until we have to finish the panel. So who wants to react? So it's also a big question for me because for me, like, insofar as money is a set of promises we make to one another, and those promises are sort of being plundered by the sort of states, right, that do things to the Amazon forest, to, you know, not letting people move borders and so on. I wonder, like, what, to what extent can we, the people, the commoners, uh, you know, do anything against that? Uh, we cannot, I've come to the conclusion that we cannot save the world, you know, this is a very uh, big illusion, but, but what we have to do is to defend ourselves. And so, Claiming a right to a basic income, it's a, it's a process, and doing it from these sort of bottom-up experiences like this, the Martin uh, was talking about in France, it's a, yeah, it's a political process, and it has to be, money shouldn't be just a commons, but as a means of commoning a right to the earth. And so it's a way it's trying to declose or the enclosures that states have made on the world. And so that's a political question, and so it shouldn't be some technical thing. And so that's, yeah, that's all I got. <laughs> And just to a quick uh, ending about what Julio uh, tells. I mean, for us, that the only truths come from experimentation. So you can do projection in the future and say, oh, is it going to work or not? No, let's, let's, let's experiment it. And let's see if, if there is people interested to, to use it, to use a, a new tool of money, a new, a new tool of, to measure our exchanges. So for the technical aspects, so I, I think the first question was if we were out of the, if we are not member, can we exchange? If you have with, the, with your universal dividend, you go on a, on a market where, where we have market during events, we are, yes. Yeah. Uh, second question for the children, there is babies creating universal dividend. So we have like about 10 now, like under, yes. The ratio exchange between so it's not stable. It depends on where you are, what are the goods and services that are sold in, lo in your location. So I can give you a rough idea of, of what is the rate approximately uh, where I am in, in, in south of, southwest of France. Uh, we can say that we are creating one UD every day and one UD is more or less one euro. So at the end of the month is like uh, 30, 30 euro. But it doesn't mean that you will be able to spend it. It depends on whether you will find goods and services that you are happy to buy. Uh, and otherwise, you can produce and get get you get you need. And and what's now? I think the first question was the tax or my my price actually the, the how much I I charge for my conference or something. If you have to pay taxes on the money you earn. Ah, no 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 no. Okay, not yet. Yeah. Okay, yeah, let's, yeah, it's, it's, perhaps you can discuss you want, that topic. I think it's the same like, like in uh, ex comes from the exchange idea that circles we build something. Sorry. later. I think because it's small, it's, no, no, it's under the radar still. Um, so there's a reaction from Matthew and Bela. W would you want to go first, Bela, before Matthew? Uh, Bob, uh, how will we get away from money and its destructiveness? I think that was your question. As an interim stage, a polyculture of different monies will be created which will sweep away the fiat currencies. 
So don't hang on to money uh, as wealth, money as we know it as wealth, because plant a few potatoes. Uh, we're going to have a kind of period of chaotic thing, I think. And then in the longer term, the, the monies will be replaced by the, the, trust, the underlying trustworthiness uh, all in a, in a context of tr transparency, visibility. And uh, Philippe, uh, can you own accounts, et cetera, and, uh, you know, money gets rid of the, the problem of coincidence of wants that the barter system didn't serve. But uh, uh, we, we won't, when we transact, I think we will in the future, over the hill, think in terms of real value to us as the transactor at the moment of the transaction. We will not think in terms of money as a store of value. You know, at the moment, we, we're kind of educated that we have to store money up for our old age or for catastrophes or whatever that we'll be looked after. So we won't have this kind of idea of is this too expensive, is it cheaper? It'll more be uh, is this what I need now and uh, is there some equity in this exchange that I'm making? It's very, very hard, I think, to get away from this idea of money as a store of value. We've got it confused. Money is a currency and a store of value. They're kind of confused in our heads. Thank you. So I wanted to respond to Bob about the theory of change of Bitcoin. And when Bitcoin originally came out, there wasn't a theory of change, but one quickly evolved that said that Bitcoin could become a new global currency. And as Bitcoin was growing very, very quickly, some people thought that could actually be possible for a while. Uh, then more and more uh, competitors came along and there was a, a new idea that there could be a new ecosystem of multiple cryptocurrencies with which we could run the world. That was much more interesting. And then there was a, an, another phase, which we're in now, where um, the cryptocurrencies are seen as business tools. So they're being invested in by venture capitalists. People come up with ideas for how they could make money out of cryptocurrencies, and then they go away and develop those. But there's a lot less talk these days of uh, Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies profoundly changing the world. Uh, from what I can see. Thank you. So, closing remarks. Thank you, Marta, for your very clear explanation of um, the blockchain and the universal dividend creation. My question is just, it doesn't, it, it's not clear to me why this is a feature only of um, blockchain currency. Why couldn't the same effect be achieved by taxation and redistribution of fiat currency? And, um, uh, Bella, you've spoken very eloquently about the sort of uncorruptibility of the blockchain, but I'd like to get Julio's response to that because it seems to me that the way you describe it is the way um, that I feel about it. I have no more trust in the people who are running blockchain currencies than I have in, in you know, my own government um, running the fiat cu currency of my country. It seems to me that the blockchain is a tool that can be used for um, good purposes or evil purposes just like fiat currency could be. So why should we expect that it will be used only for good. You know, I, I, I sort of echoing Matthew's comments here, I have heard um, at a recent conference, a different conference, you know, many very public spirited people who think that the blockchain can do, um, you know, exactly what Martin has kind of described here, you know, create an alternative currency that is more egalitarian. But I also see, you know, speculators trying to accumulate wealth and perhaps evade taxes or other, you know, forms of contribution as Philippe has described. Thank you. My question is regarding inclusiveness. Do you have to use computer to participate in uh, cryptocurrency? Yes, so uh, what about people who choose uh, low-tech life and don't want to participate in digital communication and so on? Uh, is it uh, universal for all people or is it just for those who are technologically savvy? 
Of course, you could argue that uh, we could change our education system and we should uh, teach uh, digital literacy from early on, but it also skews the society into what skills are important, what kind of interactions are important, and maybe it leaves less time for developing other skills. So that's my first comment. And second comment, uh, what I understood from your presentation is that you store data on all purchases. So they are somewhere, like accessible somewhere. And uh, in case there are hackers or people who want to access this data, it uh, makes people very vulnerable and a lot of information about their lives can be revealed to other people. So I wonder how you uh, argue about privacy issue and the right to have like purchases that you don't want other people to know about. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have some minutes for closing remarks? So if you can make closing remarks, perhaps a minute per speaker, that would be perfect. Two remarks were, were a little bit similar. Uh, so the first, uh, yes, indeed, so uh, the, the Libra money is a mathematical concept, so we can imagine a Libra money on paper. Um, so what we implemented on, on the blockchain is because uh, thanks to that, you have a decentralized organization. If you if you want to have to do a Libra money on paper or with with printed money, you will have to have a centralized authority that it's corruptible and and uh, that you can corrupt easily. And people want to gain the, the the power of maybe issuing money. The G1 is just a form on the blockchain because with the with the technology we have, it's better. Um, do we need a, a computer to uh, to use the money not in, for the, the, the G1? Not necessarily. I show that uh, we are 2,000 people in France using this money and there is only 50 uh, computers that are calculating. And if you don't have electronic devices to, to do the, the transfer or to do the transaction and everything, there is also systems like, so this is a bill <coughs> that you can exchange. So I, I don't explain how it works because I don't have time, but you, you, you can have <coughs> not electronic ways of payment uh, that can be used if you, if you are in a low-tech, um, if you live a low-tech life and you want to live it, you can still use it. There is, so on, I, I only speak about the, the June system. So on the G1 system and the Juniter blockchain, by default, the transaction and all the information are, are transparent and can be visible by everyone. But you can, <clears throat> if you choose it, if, you, if it's your decision, you, you can anonymize a certain amount of your money. So maybe not all, or all if you want. But we have system, I can enter into the detail later. Uh, we have system to anonymize the amount you want to anonymize. So it's possible, it's your own decision if you want to anonymize or not. Okay, there was one question directly to Julio. Yeah, uh, just on the on the sorry on the topic of uh, of the values and this technology, I would say that the, uh, technology only goes as far as the ethics that you put into it. Technology is a, a reflection of of your values in a way, and so just as you can have sovereign wealth funds that invest in weapons uh, and the military industrial complex, you can also have it for a basic income, and so it really is a matter of the politics inside of it and the hierarchies of knowledge inside of it, because there is a hierarchy between the programmers and the people. And so breaking those up is the, is the challenge. Um, yeah, this. Thank you. Any more closing remarks on my left? Well, really, I'd just like to respond to the lady who asked the question about uh, what about people who, who don't use technology? There was a time when ink was a technology and paper is an extraordinarily complex technology, or was. Candles are an amazing evolution of thousands of years of technological development. Basically, we will all use what we now call technology as day to day. Starlink is now being deployed, a system of uh, low level satellites uh, allowing very fast uh, connectivity for everyone on the earth, uh, on the top of Everest or in the middle of Sahara. And uh, 
that's being deployed uh, already. And uh, so basically it will become ubiquitous and we will no longer call it technology like we no longer think of paper as a technology, etc. Thank you. Hilda, Matthew? Yes, I would like to respond to the question that you asked. Um, you asked, let's say, uh, how will you protect a forest against plunder and theft? Uh, I can think of two scenarios. One is like the big scale theft that you will detect on satellite. Um, that person you can find with big brother kind of like uh, inventions and hit him where it hurts, uh, uh, hire a few hackers and plunder his bank account and give him a basic income to start over again. The small scale theft uh, you can prevent by giving a basic income because we know that the effects of a basic income reduce crime rates and particularly theft on a small scale because that's poverty related. Thanks a lot. I think we can agree. Probably almost nobody in this room needs to think about or worry about uh, blockchains or what they are or what they do. The important question in all of these situations is to do the politics first. Design your money system or your money transfer system. Work out your technical requirements and then hand them to a software engineer and ask him to or her to implement those technical requirements. And the software engineer will decide whether or not a blockchain is the right technical solution for data storage. So don't worry about it. Thank you very much. Don't worry, I think that's a nice a closing remark. Thank you very much for the vivid discussion. Thank you for the input from the panel and for your participation. So, Sarah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much.